But Hezbollah's threat was crystal clear. By late 2007, Captain Eid had become increasingly worried about his own safety. He'd taken to living in his office. I felt things. I knew that the road he was taking would eventually lead him to death. His father told me to try to convince him to at least change the kind of car he was using to commute, the jeep he was using to come to Tripoli. Then, one day, he asked his brother Mohammed to come visit and to bring the video camera. Sans aucun doute, puisqu'il savait très bien qu'il était, qu était mort d'un jour à l'autre. Il a voulu euh, nous laisser quelque chose, peut-être. It wasn't long after this video was shot that the UN investigators first stumbled across Captain Eade's lost report in their database. They finally reached out to him in January 2008. Well, that is when we started meeting with Aid because all of a sudden it was, well, who is this guy and uh, how did he do this? And to be honest with you, at the time, the skepticism was that he couldn't have done this by himself. I mean, there is no way one guy with no database like we have could have done all this. But the UN investigators discovered Captain Eade simply had a remarkable mind. After meeting with him once, they were anxious to meet again, and they did, a week later. The next day, on January 25th, 2008, Wissam Eade's prediction of his own death was fulfilled. They said on TV that there'd been an explosion. It was a Friday at 9.55 to be exact. I said if someone died, may God grant his parents patience. Then his father said, that's the road Wissam takes. I said, that's definitely Wissam. I called his superiors, and they wouldn't answer me with a yes or no. I told myself, he's gone. At the UN Commission, the reaction was not only grief, but outrage and shame. It was so clear to us that it was because of us that he died. There's no doubt in my mind. His report had been in existence with the Commission for at least a year, and nothing had happened. It wasn't until we started meeting with him that he ended up dead. We all felt responsible for this, to be honest with you. People asked themselves where the leak was, and many of them immediately thought of this man, Colonel Wissam al-Hassan, the head of Lebanese intelligence. Prior to the assassination, Colonel Hassan had been Rafiq Hariri's chief of protocol, always at his side. On the day of the assassination, though, he was absent, and his alibi attracted suspicion. All the guys who died in the convoy pretty much have an alibi. Hassan has got this weak, weak alibi. He said that he was taking a university course, and the night before Hariri was killed, he's called by his professor and told he has an exam the next day. So he goes to Hariri and he says, oh, by the way, I won't be with you tomorrow. I've got an exam to write. Now, what really happened, we you know from the phone records, is that he called the professor himself after he told Hariri he wouldn't be there, not before. Colonel Hassan went on to become Captain Eid's boss, and UN investigators suspected he'd been passing information to Hezbollah all along. They wanted to investigate Hassan's alibi, but the UN Commission's management wouldn't allow it. I wanted to get in his face. A detective's got to get into people's faces. No one had any appetite for getting into anyone's face. No one. Finally, in 2008, the UN's chief investigator asked for a written brief on Hassan. CBC News has obtained a copy. It refers to Hassan as a possible suspect in the Hariri killing and concludes that Hassan is a key interlocutor for the commission. He is in a unique position to influence our investigation. As such, questions regarding his loyalty and intentions should be resolved. Therefore, it is recommended that Hassan be investigated quietly. 
But the new UN commissioner, Daniel Belmar, had no more interest in pursuing that line of inquiry than his predecessor had had. I can recall pushing on the issue. And the answer was, you want to start a civil war in Lebanon? These things aren't done. When Rafiq Hariri's body was returned to his palace, Wissam al-Hassan was once again at his late boss's side. A lot of people would find it hard to believe Hassan could be involved. After all, he was a close friend of the Hariri family. Could he possibly have betrayed Hariri and Captain Eid? I don't know what his motivation might be. Maybe he looked around at the various Lebanese factions and he's backing Hezbollah as the winner. Maybe they have something on him. Maybe they said, we'll keep you out of the convoy if you keep giving us information in the future. Look, he lied to us. He was supposed to have died in that convoy. That's the question mark. When we return, why Hezbollah agents will probably never be brought to justice. Sitting where I sit right now in the Washington of 2010, is Hezbollah going to get away with it? Yes. Life in Beirut, at least on the surface, is calm these days. A lot calmer than it was in the weeks after Hariri's murder. Public fury pushed Syria into withdrawing the occupying army that had ruled Lebanon for 30 years. In death, Hariri managed to do what he could not in life. But the Middle East's pitiless reality has forced Hariri's son, Saad, to publicly embrace Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, the man he once publicly accused of ordering his father's murder. I mean, I was crushed when I saw that Saad Hariri had to go to Damascus. Crushed to hear the things he's saying. Syria's implicit message was obvious. Unless you want to follow your father, don't support any indictments. He's been compelled in Lebanon uh, to go along with this. I think he sees today that his major challenge is Hezbollah. He's been willing quite pra pragmatically to ally himself with Syria uh, in a way to protect himself from Hezbollah. To make matters worse, Iran is involving itself too. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was in Lebanon recently for a show of solidarity with Hezbollah. And the party of God is in a confident, belligerent mood. Its leader, Hassan Nasrallah, has reportedly threatened violence if anyone tries to enforce a UN indictment. He's also been putting out his own alternative theory about who killed Hariri. It wasn't us. Israel probably did it. As for the UN investigation, well, Danielle Balmer, a Canadian, replaced Bramertz and moved the commission to The Hague, where it now sits as a special tribunal. It has judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, and a headquarters with a big staff, just no accused. Belmar has been about as communicative as Bramertz was. I will indict when I'm ready to do so, not one minute earlier and not one minute later. Just outside the northern city of Tripoli is the hometown of Captain Wissam Eid. He's a hero here. This picture hangs everywhere. Major Wissam Eid, he was posthumously promoted, may have cracked the case, but no one seriously believes the Lebanese authorities will ever arrest anyone from Hezbollah. Sitting where I sit right now in the Washington of 2010, is Hezbollah going to get away with it? Yes. Uh, uh, fewer travesties will be greater, but uh, I don't see where the international will is to take this on. And I certainly don't see, absent that international will, how the Lebanese people uh, can take it on. Nothing 
would please the Eid family more than to see Wissam's killers brought to justice. But they know that Lebanon and perhaps even Hariri's son, whom they hold dear, would pay a price. When we see the accords politiques, we say that it's not the moment. It's the reality of Lyon, it's the reality of things. Sometimes we have to accept it. We don't have a choice. And so, instead, the mother of Major Wissam Eid offers up a prayer for the son she considers a gift to her country. A martyr is alive and never dies. If we have a few more Wissams in Lebanon, young men who love their country and are willing to sacrifice for it, then Lebanon will be just fine. واستشهد كربال هالبلد العزيز